From brain to liver, advances in Wilson's disease management. Today on Better Edge, a Northwestern Medicine podcast for physicians. I'm Melanie Cole, and we have two Northwestern Medicine physicians in a thought leader panel for you. We have Dr. Amanda Chung. She's an assistant professor of gastroenterology and hepatology. And Dr. Danny Bega. He's an associate professor of neurology. Doctors, thank you so much for joining us today. And Dr. Bega, I'd like to start with you. Give us a little overview of Wilson's disease. What's the connection between the brain and the liver in this condition, and how common is it? Thanks for the opportunity to to speak. Um, Wilson disease is a rare genetic disease that uh, is due to a mutation in a copper transporter. So it leads to problems with metabolizing copper normally. And copper is really important for our cells to function. And both problems with having too much copper or too little copper can cause disease. And this mutation in the copper transporter makes it so that copper can't be normally eliminated or removed from liver cells. And so they build up and they damage those cells and cause liver disease. And as the capacity of the, of the liver to store that copper is exceeded, it spills over into other organs and vulnerable organs in particular include the brain um, and areas of the brain involved in, in movement problems are, are a notorious problem with Wilson disease. Um, it can also lead to problems in other organs as well. Uh, but that's the typical problem is the liver disease and the brain movement disorder neurological disease that we see uh, in people who, who suffer from this genetic mutation. Thank you so much for that. And Dr. Chung, What are some of the common symptoms that providers might notice for Wilson's disease? Why is it sometimes difficult to diagnose? So one of the issues with Wilson's disease is because the presentation often can be uh, mimicked other disorders. And so it can be misdiagnosed sometimes or missed in the diagnostic process. So the main organ systems that are are involved that we think about are the liver, the neurologic system, and psychiatric system. So from a liver standpoint, it really is a wide range. So some patients, a lot of the patients actually initially will be completely asymptomatic. So they may be detected or may be diagnosed through a workup for abnormal liver test, for instance, which didn't cause any symptoms, just found incidentally on blood work. Sometimes it might just be a slightly enlarged liver or spleen. One of the large mimickers from the liver standpoint is fatty liver disease, which is actually quite common. And so because fatty liver disease itself is common, it's often just chalked up to fatty liver disease and there isn't further workup or evaluation from that standpoint. There can be a very extreme presentation of Wilson's disease from a liver standpoint, and that's with acute liver failure. Or sometimes there's been too much damage already before the patient is recognized and they can develop cirrhosis and the complications of cirrhosis. From a psychiatric standpoint, the patients can actually present with depression, just your typical symptoms of depression or bipolar disorder or even personality changes. And then from a neurologic standpoint, well, maybe I'll let Dr. Vega cover the neurologic uh, symptoms since he's the neurologist. Yeah, there, there's a spectrum of neurological conditions we'll see, and typically it's related to involvement of the basal ganglia. It's an area of the brain that's particularly susceptible to damage from, from copper buildup. And it can lead to all sorts of movement problems from commonly tremors to uh, abnormal uh, movements we call dystonia, which like contortions or overactive muscles, um, ataxia or instability of, of, of gait or balance. Uh, Parkinsonism can even be uh, mimicked with people with Wilson disease. And there can also be just generalized uh, atrophy in the brain that can lead to cognitive and other psychiatric problems as well. And then symptom-wise, the only other thing I would bring up, because every now and then while patients where the initial diagnosis comes from them seeing an eye doctor and noticing these rings that we call Kaiser Flesher rings, and sometimes that might be the first presentation where a patient goes to an eye doctor and the eye doctor says, oh, something's going on with your eyes, they don't look normal, and then that will be ultimately to diagnosis. 
Dr. Bega, as we're speaking about how Wilson's disease is typically diagnosed, expand and elaborate for us a little bit on the role of genetic testing in the diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Sure. The most important thing in diagnosing Wilson's disease is sus- suspecting it, which it's not always at the top of mind for everybody because it's a rare disease and some people have never seen it before. Um, and so it's really important to kind of have a high level of suspicion for it. Um, whenever someone has unexplained uh, hepatic or neurological symptoms, uh, particularly in people who are younger, let's say under age 60, who may have unexplained neurological or hepatic symptoms. And uh, oftentimes it comes to diagnosis with uh, blood work and urine tests that we can do. Um, oftentimes we'll need a, a liver biopsy to actually confirm uh, copper buildup in the liver. But as you mentioned, genetic testing is available to us and we can test for the genetic mutation in the what's called the ATP7B gene. That is the gene for the copper transporter that is deficient and missing in people with Wilson disease. And so we can test for that gene. It's not usually the first test that we do for diagnosis, but it can help us in making a diagnosis. Um, and it does have there uh, some potential uh, drawbacks. It's not available to everybody at every hospital in every place. We do have it at Northwestern. We're able to test for it. Um, but it also, in isolation, is not used to make a diagnosis. It's just one tool that we'll use in our toolbox. I'd like you both to answer the next question. Dr. Chung, starting with you, tell us about the Northwestern Medicine Wilson Disease Clinic. And as a neurologist and hepatologist, how do you work together? Tell us a little bit about how the multidisciplinary approach works where you collaborate with many different professionals. Yeah, that's a great uh, point to touch on because I think um, all caregivers for Wilson's disease recognize that the best care approach is actually a multidisciplinary approach. So the three big organ systems that are involved is liver, neurology, and psychiatry. And so while not every patient has a manifestation in each of these categories, um, some of them will, and sometimes it will go undetected. So there, that is one of the reasons why we have the clinic that we have at Northwestern. So at our clinic, we have, as far as clinicians, we have um, a neurologist, which is Dr. Vega, a hepatologist, which is me. We have a psychiatrist that's specifically for the Wilson's disease patients. We have a social worker, um, a, a dietitian, a geneticist, and a lot of support staff that helps to take care of these really complicated patients. And I'll just add that um, because we have this big multidisciplinary team, sometimes for patients and families, they'll be seeing us, they'll be there for three hours sometimes, seeing multiple different providers. But the advantage is a one-stop shop for problems that are all interrelated. And also the ability for us to converse in real time about management plans um, rather than having to, you know, catch each other at other other times to to run management plans. Um, so we can collaborate a little bit easier. And it's, I think it's safer for patients too that all of the providers are on the same page with, with the management. Uh, I do think that the, the social worker and the dietitian um, have made a huge difference in our ability to improve people's quality of life. Um, they meet with almost every patient in our clinic because there's almost always some needs there that they can, they can find ways to assist with. Dr. Bega, can you discuss recent research that shapes our understanding of Wilson's disease with emerging therapeutic options, gene therapy, targeted molecular agents? How do you see the future landscape of Wilson's disease treatment and management evolving? Well, Wilson's disease is thought of as untreated. It's a fatal disease. And we're lucky to be dealing with a a disease where today we have treatments that can save people's lives, that keep them from progressing, um, that can keep them stable for their entire life um, on the right treatment. And so that's fortunate compared to some other diseases. And that's one of the reasons it's really important to to diagnose it and identify it early is because we do have treatments. But the big areas for research right now are, can we improve on the existing uh, therapies that we have in terms of their ease of use, in terms of their tolerability, in terms of their Uh, accessibility to patients, and their ability to adequately remove copper from the body. And so that's one area of active research is trying to improve 
on drugs that remove copper. Um, and then the other really exciting area of research is gene therapy, because we know the gene responsible for, for the disease um, is, is trying to uh, uh, introduce the normal ATP7B gene, the normal copper transporter, into the liver cells so that they can then start to make the normal copper transporter and, uh, and treat the disease uh, using replacement of the missing gene. And so we're actively engaged in those trials, uh, industry trials involved in, in delivering that. Usually uh, the, the companies doing this right now are using viral vectors to deliver the normal ATP7B message um, to, the, to the liver cells um, so that they can then produce the normal gene for the normal protein. Dr. Chung, from your perspective... What's exciting in diagnostic methods or technologies to improve the detection of Wilson's disease? Speak about how recent developments in imaging modalities have helped you with monitoring of hepatic and neurological manifestations. Sure. So, you know, our, our current way of both diagnosing and then monitoring patients who have Wilson's disease is based on blood work and a 24-hour urine copper. So that's collecting your own urine for 24 hours, um, and as it probably sounds, is quite cumbersome and annoying, but unfortunately is what we need to do to be able to monitor patients. And in some patients, we may be asking them to do this once a month, every three months, but not infrequently that they need to do it. Um, as Dr. Baker alluded to earlier, at the time of diagnosis, some patients do ultimately get a liver biopsy so we can quantify the amount of copper in the liver. Usually, we're not repeating that as part of the management strategy. Um, so the, the newer developments that are underway right now are really about how can we monitor these patients in uh, the most effective way, but in a less cumbersome way. And from a patient perspective, I think the most annoying part for them is having to actually collect that 24-hour urine um, so it's having to be home for 24 hours and sticking in the fridge, and these are just things that are difficult for them to complete sometimes. So there is some, there is a, a couple companies out there that are testing a serum, a blood marker that can adequately quantify how much copper is effectively potentially causing damage in the body. So we can check a copper level right now in the blood, but that actually isn't uh, clinically significant as far as telling us how much copper is actually problematic in the body. So we need these other biomarkers. And I think probably within the next year or so, we'll probably have those available to us, and which will um, be a big game changer as far as management over time. It's very exciting time in your field. And Dr. Bega, are there any clinical trials that you'd like to speak about? You know, we do have the, a trial called Cyprus going on at Northwestern right now, and this is a, it's an industry trial. Ultragenics is the company, um, and it's uh, a really interesting design of a phase one, two, three trial, meaning they've designed it all under one protocol. Um, and this is uh, the gene therapy trial that I alluded to, where it's a single uh, one-time IV infusion of a uh, AAV9 vector that carries the normal ATP7B gene um, uh, message to, again, to hepatocytes um, in hopes that it will then allow for the normal production of the, of the protein, of the ATP7B protein. Um, and so that's an active study that's going on um, uh, throughout the country at a, at a few sites, including ours. Um, and uh, there's another company also working on a uh, gene therapy drug. Uh, we don't have that trial going on at Northwestern, but uh, it's, it's nice to see that in the field there's more than one company working on this, given that it's a rare disease. Um, but because of that, we really do need people to be aware of it. Um, there's only so many people who are eligible and interested and willing to participate. And, and given that it's a rare disease, we really need them to be aware of the trials that are going on. And to be clear, just so it's in case it's not, the gene therapy trials are really cool because what we're implying is that if it works, it's essentially a cure. So patients with Wilson's disease have to take medications for the rest of their lives. And discontinuing medications can actually be fatal if um, they discontinue it long enough before we catch wind of it. Um, so the gene therapy trials, if they work, and we're hopeful that they will, would be a huge change in the management of these patients. 
And um, to that point, actually, the the trial is the endpoint of the trial in terms of how it's going to measure success is going to be whether we can take people off of their standard of care therapy. And so if we're able to take people who are on stable standard of care therapy and wean them off of it, then we'll we'll know that the the trial is that's the measure of success of this trial. Right. So not not only like being cured, but in not having to have the cumbersome task of doing labs and taking meds and whatnot. But these medications that we use to treat Wilson's disease are extremely expensive. So it could have a huge impact if we can dose them with the gene therapy that essentially cures them. It'll save them so much money long term in their lifetime. This has been such an enlightening and informative episode, and I'd love to give you each a chance for a final thought here. Dr. Bega, understanding that this is a rare disease from the perspective of your specialty, what advice do you have for other physicians that suspect Wilson's disease in their practice? And if so, what would be their next step? Yeah, that's a great question. I think as a neurologist or a general practitioner, if you're seeing someone with neurological symptoms, they're generally, if they're under 60 years old and they're developing unexplained tremors, Parkinsonism that you think might be young onset Parkinsonism, um, other abnormal movements, gait ataxia. Um, it is worth doing some simple screening tools to, uh, to, to think about Wilson disease. Again, if you don't think about it, it won't be on your radar. You'll miss it. Um, and 99% of the time you're going to screen and it'll be normal. Uh, but it, but the low stakes tests that you can do in those patients are checking a 24-hour urine copper collection, uh, a serum ceruloplasmin test, and and potentially a slit lamp eye exam that Dr. Chung mentioned for, to look for Kaiser Fleischer rings, which is copper deposition uh, in a layer of the eye. Uh, those are simple, fairly harmless things to do that um, to to just raise your level of suspicion. Um, and I think if you don't think about doing it, you don't do it enough. Um, even though most of the time you'll do it, it'll be normal. Um, I think you'll miss it. So, and then with any questions, definitely send them to a Wilson disease expert. We're happy to see them, particularly the, the, the confusion that I see comes up with people who see the serum copper tests and don't know how to interpret it. Um, and again, as Dr. Chung said, the serum copper test doesn't necessarily reflect the status of copper that we're interested in and, and can lead to a lot of confusion about whether people do or don't have Wilson disease. Um, but the, the tests that I mentioned are pretty valuable and can be done even in, in advance of sending them to a Wilson Disease Center uh, to see if it's necessary to, to be seen by a specialist. Dr. Chung, last word to you. Yeah, so I'll have to kind of echo what Dr. Vega said as far as just having a very high uh, index of suspicion um, for these patients. So from a liver perspective, for instance, again, as we mentioned way early in the beginning of this podcast, is that... Um, sometimes the patients does present with abnormal liver tests, like the transaminases, the AST and ALT are mildly elevated, or they may present with imaging that shows what we think is fatty liver at least. So for instance, fatty liver disease, quite common, a third of the population has metabolic associated fatty liver disease. But let's say you have a patient who comes in and they have imaging that shows fatty liver disease, but they have no metabolic uh, um, diagnosis. So for instance, the diabetes and uh, being overweight and things like that. Well, that should be a pretty high clinical uh, suspicion that there's something else going on, Wilson's being one of them. Um, and because a lot of times patients may be asymptomatic leading up to the diagnosis, if patients, when they come in for cirrhosis or an abnormal liver test, it's often, most people would say, it really should be considered one of the standard tests that you order in the very beginning, just looking. And um, as Dr. Baker mentioned, you may order so many and not have very many positives because it's relatively rare, but it's still worth it for that patient that you are going to diagnose earlier than you would have if you let them decompensate further. Thank you both so much for joining us today. To refer your patient or for more information, please visit our website at breakthroughsforphysicians.nm.org slash neuro to get connected with one of our providers. That concludes this episode of Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for joining us today.